another episode of the 72 Pink. With us this week, we have Josh. Hey, what up? And Tom. Howdy, everybody. How's it going, y'all? Dude, so good right now. Yeah, really good, yeah. actually. I have had a pretty decent day. Saw some friends hanging out. Now I'm back hanging with more friends and jamming. You're jamming. We are jamming. I am jamming currently. I mean, currently? come on and slam and welcome to the jam. I believe, <laughs> I believe that's a direct quote from President Barack Obama. I so think that's uh, what he said. Yeah. Um, yeah. Would you like to elaborate on what you're jamming, Josh? Uh, we, uh, the I guess a fairly large group of us now <laughs> we're all uh we're all in a game jam right now we're we're making we have three days to create a video game and we are doing it i think tom and you can all kind of elaborate more on that too submissions are due in two days two hours 56 minutes and 42 seconds it is the pixel weekend jam number three uh first prize is bragging rights uh and and really we're not doing this to win because let's be real we're not going to none of us have ever successfully made a game before uh many of us have tried to make a game before and just failed miserably so hey, hey speak for yourself i made a game where i had two hoops up in vr and i had a ball and you would throw it through it and the smaller hoop would give you more points than the bigger hoop it's you got good. farther than me and I made, than me. I made my own assets and everything so fuck you i've done that <laughs> in vr assets oh i said a joke uphill uphill um, both ways yeah it was really good <laughs> right now well tom why don't you elaborate on the engine since well, this is like kind of an interesting different thing that we've never kind of we've never really talked about stuff like this before yeah yeah so i i think was that last week i talked about uh celeste putting in a pico 8 game and what i didn't realize is that um they built they they prototyped their game idea in this fantasy console as i call it called pico 8 uh which has got super tight requirements it, it almost feels like developing a game uh for a game boy color you've got a very limited you know 16 color color palette um 128 by 128 pixels that's 16 by 16 uh tiles per screen four sound channels which adam did all the music and the sound effects and i told him he he like spent all this time and he was super annoyed at the engine like trying to make decent sounding music with four channels and then i had to come back to him after i did some reading i'm like yeah we can't have sound effects unless you cut it down to three channels he's like <laughs> are you serious i have to go and retool an entire song removing one sound channel i was like yeah but he oh, did man. he did and it sounds great and we've got sound effects and we've got music and josh has created all kinds of graphics and animations frame by frame shit uh Irk built an entire physics engine um uh, we've we've got people helping out all over the place and it's fantastic uh we actually have a member of the community uh nuclear wizard doing some of the code for us as well yeah it's it's been pretty cool it's like it, there's a lot of a lot of people coming out of the woodworks and if you're interested in like just come checking it out like after the podcast we'll we'll be jamming we're just gonna be we're just gonna be jamming so come on yeah. over and and come yell at us and hang that, out see that would have <laughs> been the time to pull the space jam reference come on to come on jam. and slam so, so come on and slam yeah yeah it and, welcome, been. and welcome to the jam yeah there's, there, a, there, there, <laughs> there's a lot less enthusiasm on that round through that statement so. <laughs> there well there by the time no, we do the joke for the 20th time i think the enthusiasm no, dude, will be back no, what do you there's mean no limit no limit on the amount of space jam references you can throw into something no he's limit. right he's absolutely right it's like a three-point dunk with a twenty arm or twenty-foot arm. It's all nice. Good. I like I like that uh, that that that's a very subtle. Yeah. <laughs> so subtle. <laughs> so so subtle because I mean that it's, that that goes everywhere. It's, it's subtle. So the the Pico Eight is actually kind of kind of different for for me personally. I've never actually bought a game engine, um, and I I paid for this one. I actually bought a couple copies of this one, um, and. I gotta say, even though it's very limited, it's definitely designed for prototyping. It's hard to work with because it doesn't give you a lot of the niceties that Unreal or Unity would give you, uh, or even uh, Godot. Um, 
I I like it. I really do. It it keeps you from doing anything too crazy because you know you have to build it yourself. Well, the yeah. annoying thing to me is the single file part of it. Because to me, I think the multiple files, even without complexity, allows you to make the code read better. You have a player file. That's true. Everything related to the player is Did- in that file. So here, real quick, before we get too deep into this concept, um, does anybody, have we ever talked about like what you guys do? Have we ever said that, you know, you, that you guys aren't, you know, armchair programmers per se? <laughs> I don't know if anybody knows, like, I'm a, uh, you, yeah. you, you kind of know what you're doing. I think we've kind of alluded to it before. Tom and I both work for a big, big fortune five company. <laughs> um, yeah and, you're gonna put them as low as five um, right. i'm just giving some space you know so they have to kind of guess yeah. where we're at even though we've talked yeah. about shipments and game it's development definitely dnj's pizza shed straight out <laughs> straight out of st paris ohio that's where Irk and i work we are programmers for the cnj pizza enterprise there you go you heard it here first everybody whenever you See click it. that order pizza button we're the ones that make it go yeah, <laughs> you're so exactly. stupid. You we, so we actually we have we're so good programmers. We decided not to script this because we on. didn't trust Can it. Can we clip that? We, so we are so good programmers. <laughs> yes, we are so good programmers that we didn't even script it because we don't trust the computer. We actually hand type every order as it comes in. <laughs> yes, and then we don't yep. trust the staff that works there. So actually, what's happening is we're closed right now. But as soon as this cast is over, we're opening the shop back up and we're going to make the pizzas by hand because we don't trust oh, yeah. anyone. No, God no. Totally scalable solutions. Yeah, yeah. I think I only think the really highest quality. The end, fair end user respect. is usually the issue anyway. It is, but it's, no. Well, that's why <laughs> um, when when an order comes in from an end user and they're like. Hey, I would like some green peppers on this pizza. I'm like, no, you're going to get a pizza full of meat because it's better. And they come to me <laughs> afterwards and they say, you know, Tom, I really appreciate the way you modified my order without my permission or, or even without me asking you to. Uh, because you're right. The pizza was better with only meat. Because that's how pizza should be. Actually, no, I do like pineapple. But um, pineapple's so good. I'm going to give green olives a pass. I do like green olive. Jalapenos. Jalapenos yeah, on a pizza, baby. Yeah, good old spicy pizza. But um, <laughs> we just back... lost like a lot of viewers. <laughs> yeah, I know. Everyone, everyone leaves because of pineapple, not because jalapeno. Most people don't have I, issue I, with there, jalapeno. A, yeah, people are pretty passionate about the no pineapple rule. Yeah, Dude, it's so good. It's so good. Hawaiian pizzas are fantastic. For a while, I didn't like the texture on it, so I would still pick the pineapples off. But just cooking it with the pineapple on it puts that flavor into the pizza. Like, yeah. okay, you don't want the fruit on it afterwards. Take it off. Fine. But the flavor it puts in while you're cooking, ah, it's kind of like how I don't like bacon <laughs> so being good. cooked on the pizza. Like, if you put bacon on a really? pizza, I think it's best to, like, crumble it and put it on after baking. Okay. Now, I, okay. I will say, I will totally admit, and I'm a, I'm a bacon fiend, that bacon very easily overpowers a pizza. So bacon needs to be hinted onto the pizza, not necessarily drowned in it. Unless you're having a bacon only pizza, which is totally fine. And my grandma always did this beef. She would put hamburger on the, and it's just <clears throat> the flavor of the hamburger is so strong that if you're trying to do a standard pizza with a hamburger on, it's like, no, you have to do like a barbecue or something like that with hamburger. Yeah, yeah, something something that's got enough of a punch that you're not overwhelmed by just the burger taste. Yes, absolutely. Holy shit, did so, we just go into pizza talk based off of this game engine? A game jam? Yes, yeah. yes. Right. Yeah. So Pico 8 reason. is like <laughs> the, best, the best personal pan pizza, and it's not any bigger than a personal pan pizza because that's all you need, that you make everything yourself and then you take a picture of it and upload it to Instagram. And somehow people can take that picture and eat it. One of my favorite features about this. <laughs> that was a, that, that, what, that you can take this explaining. picture and eat it. It's yeah. a bit. You yeah, never mind. Just roll with it. That, <laughs> my, that's my that's favorite, fine. <laughs> my favorite feature of this engine is uh, you can actually export your game, your full fucking game as a picture. 
and it looks like a tiny game cartridge. And what they do is they actually do some cool computer science-y things that I'm not going to get into right now. Uh, and they embed the game into the actual image itself. So you can hand this to someone and say, here's my game, and they could play it. That's all they need is the picture. No downloads, no nothing. It's really fucking cool. Uh, and the engine, when I said we bought it, like, it's not expensive. It was 15 bucks. So See, I was going to let you seem like a money bags at first by not saying the price, no. but okay. No, no, 15 bucks. Um, you can actually go play Pico 8 games without the engine. So if you wanted to play them on the web, uh, just you know, Google Pico 8 and you will find a giant list of games. Uh, Celeste is one of them if you want to try a really good game. Um, yeah, Soon ours it's will be pretty one of fantastic. If you want to try a maybe not so well-developed game. <laughs> you know, it, it will be okay. I think so, it's going to be great. I'm really I, excited. I can see this engine staying around and being something that exists for a while, but it would have to be in the prototype kind of thing. I don't. Th oh, this is this engine is only made for prototyping games and getting a minimum viable product and idea. So the the Celeste guys, you know, they they made this game and they said, "Wow, this is really fucking great. Let's build a big one." And then they spent two years building a full game, uh, and that's what this is designed for. Yeah, because it, it has the core of what you get in a normal engine of typically the way okay the way working in a game engine works um from a more technical detail is the engine has four mm. five six it has a set number of calls it's going to call and what you do is say hey i know you're going to call animate so i'm going to make my own animate function that every time you call this i'm going to inject what i want you to do so game engines give you these hooks so there's just three really simple hooks that we're using in this. So it's just real easy to grab into to make it very quick. The rest of the engine just takes care of the rest. It does all the ticking itself. You don't have to try to adjust the frame or the tick rate or anything like that. Which is yeah, really the thing nice. it doesn't give you is a lot of the niceties. So in Unity, um, you've got you know not only the asset store, but you actually have um, cool... Uh, code functions that you can pull in so if you want a first person shooter control scheme you go oh import first person shooter control scheme and then it just works it's literally that easy to get a, a default controller configuration going in pico well, 8 not so easy and you what have to build it yourself and what really helps like things like unity it's in a modern language to where you just import all that stuff no problem and then it allows you to also say this ball right here i want it to act special so you click on it and all of a sudden it just opens up this entire interface of how do you want this exact ball to work you save it and you'll say this is going to be ball special and then you can start applying that tag to other balls that you want to act like that and it's just really nice how it lets you do a lot of really fine-tuned stuff and then percolate it out very easily yeah, I, I gotta say, like, after, after you know, getting halfway through this game, Jim, I have to say that I do love Pico 8. I will not recommend it to anyone for their first game engine, unless you want to <laughs> get really low level, really down and dirty, like, like, scraping, uh, like, scraping together your own physics engine kind of down and dirty if you want to make a platforming game. Um, it, it's great for learning. I'm learning a whole lot. I'm sure everyone else is learning a lot. Uh, <laughs> okay, but, yeah. It is by no way or no means uh, an easy task to build a simple game in this. So I want to make one call out. I think a few weeks ago, you said the physics engine of Rocket League was going to be one of the easiest things for that game to have built. Now that you've been a little more hands-on with the physics engine, do you change your mind? Yes and no. So, so they have, they're built in a modern engine, right? They're using Unreal. They have... Um, they have a physics engine packaged up in Unreal that they can tune and tweak, and the tuning and tweaking takes the majority of the time, right? Actually getting a base level of physics doesn't. For us, we're, we spent a fucking day and a half trying to get our stupid little princess to not fall through floors that we had placed. <laughs> and we finally did it. I'm really proud of it, but by God, that was not easy. Yeah, Pixel pixel shit the the thing i'll say about modern engines is to hit detection you can almost get it out the door um yeah. advanced physics like deflection and stuff is not out the door you have to actually do like surface strength reflection all you have to do some configuring for that but yeah hit box detection is a bitch i'm just gonna leave it at that i don't want to go any more technical yeah, yeah way I, th too technical. I think we, we've been in it <laughs> 
but yeah, it's it's been fun. Um, oh, yeah, this has been a blast. Spe speaking of uh, Celeste and Pico 8, though, um, so the full game of Celeste does have um, the Pico 8 version. It's, it's hidden. You can find it. It's not really a secret. You can actually Google Celeste Pico 8 and play it on your computer in a web browser right now. Um, so I beat it, and it was hard as fuck. Uh, so it took me 30 minutes to beat this game. Um, really well made, controlled super tight. The music was really enjoyable. Uh, the effects that you can get out of just the smallest number of pixels imaginable is fantastic. Um, and then, then it was really demoralizing because I watched a 100% speed run and no deaths, all strawberries, just fucking wrecked <laughs> this game in two minutes flat. Holy and I was shit. like, holy fucking shit. I just spent a half an hour and skipped all the strawberries because I just couldn't do it. Um, so yeah, <laughs> yeah, check check that out if you want the dark souls of 2D platformers. Yeah, that gets overused. <laughs> what no, do you mean? I we're think, in I the think... we're in the Dark Souls of era. That's this is what this yeah, is what I it think... is. This is really the Dark Souls of podcast. And I well, how about I start saying, you know what? The Dark this Souls is... of is an overused phrase. It's really the Dark Souls of overused phrases being overused. I was going right. to say, you know, it's the Ninja Gaiden of. You know, the, 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 the really hard, hard started off with the save point. You have to do a shit ton of progress for and die and go all the way we back. Can go, like, and metal still go slug. We can go like Metal Slug. We can keep going back, you guys. Like, no, no, Metal Slug. Metal Slug belongs nowhere in this conversation. I love Metal Slug, but it was designed to be unfair. It was designed as was a quarter, quarter monster eater. first and foremost. Yep. Yes, exactly. You you okay. can't compare like even even like Ninja Gaiden Black, right? It's a fucking hard game, but it's a fair game, right? You got to get good. Metal Slug, there's no getting good at. You you <laughs> literally just feed quarters into the machine until you win, and that's how you play Metal Slug. I love that you said Ninja Gaiden Black was fair. Was that yeah, your way of saying Ninja Gaiden was a little, um, a little uh, shitty? Black Black made some, you know, improvements to the it formula. It put a diaper that, on uh... you. <laughs> it put a fucking diaper on you, man. They they've added more save points. They nerfed some of the enemies. Fuck that. I, Play Ninja I don't Gaiden. Think you OG. Ninja Gaiden was fair. I do. I beat it. It was a bitch. But yeah, yeah. Anyway, anyway, anyway. I'm no. So Celeste, uh, I played a little bit of that. Fuck strawberries. Um, I have now like the game has gotten hard enough where in the early worlds I was actually actively collecting everything I could and everything I came across, and in the later worlds I'm just like, oh, that's a nice strawberry. No one's ever going to get that. Okay, time to move on. Because you can beat the levels without getting the collectibles. They are not required in any way. Uh, and I am just skipping them now because the game has gotten hard enough where I am eschewing optional, uh, optional challenges. The game is just hard enough by default. Um, haven't beat it? Getting closer, though. Hmm, getting nice. closer. Yeah, I haven't beat any games. I've gotten further in Kirby. And... It's Kirby. Um, the play, uh, the um, yeah. you get a party of four, you and three others, and you like throw a heart and you like get people to join your side. Like I referenced last time, I've gotten further, seen some more integrations. It's not just anymore like I have a sword catching on fire. You'll get a like a Venus or a, a beetle kind of guy, and you hold up, and he'll like, okay, I'll do a team move, and he puts his little heart up. You run into him, he grabs you and just throws you into fuckers. Or okay. you'll have someone with a chef hat huh. and you hold up. He's like, okay, I'll do a team move and he'll make a big stew and like everyone will jump in it and then just shoot all over the place like fireworks. <laughs> it's, it's really fun. Um, it's cute. The game's not hard. Uh, at least so far, it's been super easy. It's a kid's game. Like it's, it's a super simple kid's game that I just, I've always enjoyed Kirby though. Since I've been <laughs> I wish, I wish that I, I know why Kirby exists, right? It, especially on the the first game on the Game Boy, right? It was supposed to be a game that was accessible to everyone. Uh, but the one I remember most fondly was the one on the NES, where I actually had to work my fucking ass off as a kid, because that game got really fucking hard at the end. Um, and it, it seems like every Kirby game I play now is a little... 
hand holding. And maybe that's the niche, right? Maybe that's the the realm that Kirby fills. But Kirby 64 wasn't really a, a passive game, but everything after that, it seems, has been. Well, see, what I'm wondering is they're, if they're giving it the Odyssey treatment where we're going to let you beat this game and it's going to be easy because let's all be honest, Odyssey was possibly the easiest Mario to get credits I've ever played. It was yeah. pretty easy. Like getting through, yeah. like I finished it up to a good chunk. I haven't done all the Dark World stuff, but yeah, I, I agree. It's pretty easy to, to just blitz through. And that's where I'm thinking maybe this is getting the Odyssey treatment of, yeah, we'll let you beat the game easy. And then if you keep going, we'll start to show you some of the real game. Yeah, I like the, that. The stuff the five-year-olds <laughs> aren't going to be playing. Well, I hope, but then I'll be struggling and then give it to like my nephew who's seven years old and he'll just like whip the shit out of it. Yep. Yeah. So I'm an old decrepit man. That's how it works, man. We just get angry. This isn't anything like I remember games. And then they're Back like... Back in my day, Dota 2 used to balance for skill. <laughs> now they make these just, people I'm named Willowleaf. <laughs> I'm sorry. I I'm fucking... Just... it. I don't know if we ever talked about this. The newest two characters, oh Willowleaf is fucking bullshit. And Dave, if you ever, <laughs> wa if you ever watch this, Dave... Fuck you, because I fucking hate Willow. Um, so a few weeks ago, we had that as a postcast game. Went actually, it's Dark Willow. Dark Willow, sorry, but actually went really well. We had like it. nine of us playing in the postcast, but um, it was Dave, a lot of fun. Dave uses her and pretty well yeah. to where he uses that ulti at a really good time. And for fuck's sake, she puts all these entanglements up, and everyone just gets stun locked. It's absurd and annoying and obnoxious and fuck that character but that's <laughs> okay okay how long have you and i been playing dota 2 that's par for the course whenever a new hero is released it is overpowered and almost intentionally so to make the community develop counterplay around that hero if the hero was underpowered or even even like at a balanced level the community wouldn't bind together to figure out how to counter this person and then you wouldn't develop professional counter material or professional counter strategies for months instead they make willow super overpowered and in two weeks you have like the perfectly tuned counter and it has like pervaded its way through pro and the pub metas so everyone knows exactly how to counter her um, well it always goes i, I think pro, it's intentional it goes, i really do it goes pro meta and then pubs trying and getting stomped because they're not as good as the pros it's typically right, how right, i'm used until, to seeing that go uh, until until they figure out like oh all i have to do is build this one item on this character that wouldn't normally have it right like hey is pa wrecking your shit build an mkb okay. or uh yeah yeah uh, yeah mkb not a bkb yeah mkb you got yeah it. but um one other thing i do I want to say about dota i know but one thing i want to get about dota real quick uh and turbo they i don't know if those in all modes but there's a pick now in non-captain's mode, or a ban that's in non-captain's mode now. So <clears throat> if you really suck against Willow, you can ban her. If you really suck you against can. PA, you can ban her initially like you would in captain's mode, which is really fun. I like it. It was a good touch. Really good. Good, 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 good touch. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. Um, so, Tom, I know you played this, and Josh, I think you did too. Um, what do you guys think of the mobile uh, battle royales that are out there so far? I played so one. I, yeah, I don't think Fortnite is available on Android yet. Ah, okay. I, yeah, I don't. It's, it's getting there. I don't game on my phone much, so I didn't know. I game on my phone constantly. I play. I play a lot of games on my phone. In fact, I think I played more games on my phone this week than I have. Like as as far as new stuff. Yeah. Um, but uh, I didn't like it. I mean, I, it was fine. I, it was PUBG. So, like, the thing I didn't like about it is that it's regular PUBG. It just is PUBG, which is cool because if you really, really like PUBG and you need that experience on the go, there's just, you know, it, it works, right? It, it, it functions, but it's just really long. It's really, really long to be it's playing way on your too phone. Like, it's just long. way too long to be playing on your phone. I, I think Souls brought that up on our Discord earlier this week. It's like, I don't want to be on my phone for a 45-minute match. Exactly. No, so it's, it's I, super I made that mistake. 
I made that mistake. I, I saw that, hey, it's available now. I'm like, holy shit. So I downloaded it. I installed it. I started playing. And this is like, I had you know, 20 minutes before I wanted to leave for work and fired it up. And 45 fucking minutes later, I'm like, okay. Uh, now I go to work. Yeah. Yeah. But in, it's, it, I don't want to call it painful, but it's uncomfortable holding the phone and playing with that control scheme for that long, right? If it were, you know, a 10 minute, 15 minute match, if it were PUBG Turbo, it would be fine. Uh, but it's not. It's a 45 minute commitment on your phone unless you want to drop out. And if you're playing squads, you now fuck over three other people. Um, how does it, the it works well? How does the friend system really work? Well. Have you tried to add a friend? I have not tried to add a friend, but they do have an embedded chat system in there where people like just start spamming, you know, looking for group or looking for one more. And they've got buttons that say join squad. So I hit one of those. I had three other random people. No one talked to each other, uh, except that there's like a quick chat system, which works OK. Um, and we we wrecked, right? We We ended up in second. It was really good. Um, the majority of the people in PUBG Mobile are bots, like the okay, majority was, of the players. I was mm -hmm. going to ask if... Not, yeah, yeah so, not like people botting the game, but like actual CPU players. Um, and from what I've read, the game will, you know, slowly decrease the amount of bots per match um, until you get good enough to play all humans all the time. So they say that. Um, I think they that's do. a, I think that's a bold statement and I think that's their way of hedging. You know what? We understand it might be hard to get a hundred players at once. So we're actually just going to have bots as a mechanic and make them feel like they'll eventually earn their way out of it. Right. Yeah. That's, and, that's okay. Oh, for it, mobile. It, I think it's great, but yeah, sort of is what it is. It's, it, it's, it's kind of like a, is what it is kind of situation for me. It's like, Hey, look at, we could also do it on mobile. Everyone's like. Right on. So I will say and that's this. it. Like that's, that's what I One feel. thing that they, they did add is auto pickups. So if you go in with you know, oh, an SMG yeah. and you walk into a room that's got a bunch of ammo that's not going to fit your gun, you've got a bunch of atta attachments that's not going to fit your gun, um, it has an intelli intelligent-ish uh, auto pickup system. Um, so I had an SMG, I had an extended mag, um, and it found the extended quick draw mag, which is better. Anyone would trade those out. And as I walked over it, my dude automatically reached down, picked it up and attached it to the gun. Um, yeah, I that's mean, nice. It's really nice because getting I was thinking, OK, I have to walk in and tap this, you know, action button over and over and over again to get this gear. That's not how it works at all. You go into a house, you walk and you sit somewhere for a couple seconds while your guy auto-loots everything. Um, it's really, really well done. Um, I do think that it, would, it wouldn't it would fit well into the PC, um, but on mobile, it feels right at home. It is very, very well done. So one thing I did want to bring up, we mocked this when they initially announced it because, and as it still feels, why do you really want to play it mobile other than just to try it out? That said... Everything I've heard is they fucking nailed it. Them and Tencent fucking nailed a mobile adaptation for that they game. They did. They did. They really they did. did. There's no question about that. It's not, there's no, uh, it, it feels like PUBG on the go. Like there's nothing, there's nothing about it that isn't just PUBG on the go. The issue comes from the platform itself. Like the games that are fun on mobile aren't the games that are fun on, uh, on PC or a console. They just aren't. Even, even in a, like mobile games are like aren't there it, just, they're, they're touch monument. screen they're all they're, touch screen right i like, don't want to play Valley. it's animal crossing it's mario run it's tiny stupid simple shit that i can play for four minutes i can shut off my phone and i don't i don't lose any progress right i feel like i've done something um but asking and, me to sit for even even 20 minutes is way too long to be sitting on my phone playing a game for me it's Unless, not less like it's not length for me though. Like it's I girth. like, I like, yeah, but no, it's, <laughs> it's, um, it's more like the, like, I like doing Sudoku's on my phone. And if I do a hard Sudoku, it might take me 15 minutes, 20 minutes, no problem. But it's, I think it's the type, the way it feels like I'm, I won't do Sudoku at my desktop ever. No fucking way. If I'm on my desktop, I'm not wasting that kind of resource. And I think the inverse is if there's a game that's super intense, 
I don't want to do that. Not even if it's That's a, a good five, point. even if it's a five minute intense and very short span. I don't want something ultra intense on the phone. Now that said, uh, so none of us have talked about it because we haven't played it, but Fortnite Mobile on iOS right now is fucking killing it. Uh, currently, there are, and I, I wish I had a, a news item linked in here, but there are tons of high school teachers and high schoolers saying that ever since Fortnite Mobile came out, high school has just been completely worthless. It's really just a place where people gather to play Fortnite. And you could say that about any hip game, right? Back back when I was a kid, you know, we would talk about the latest PC games, right? We'd talk about Counter-Strike. We'd, oh my Unreal. God, we'd talk about Halo, Unreal, Halo, right? That was the thing. But now you can whip out your phone and you know, play Fortnite. Uh, I guess also when I was a kid, you could whip out your Game Boy and play Pokemon Red or Blue. Um, yeah, but then you needed a cable or you needed to have oh a Oh my god, we've IR. been visited by Robo Eric. <laughs> it is Robo Eric. <laughs> Run, Everyone. save yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit. No. Yes, your family. Yeah, I, yeah I, heard, I heard Fortnite was pretty crazy on mobile. I heard that... Uh, it looks cool. I can't play it. So like, you know, I'm, I'm waiting for it. I think I honestly think it would be better than PUBG if only because the matches are shorter. I, I don't love I think see... it's I think it's just too short or still too long still. I just don't probably I don't see probably. any like most pretty much. I just don't see. I don't I don't see a reason for it. In general. Um, yeah, so <laughs> Eric is telling us to laugh for some reason. Like, <laughs> 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 That's so cringy. Uh, okay, okay, uh, you, you, you uh, okay. It's out of the bag. No, no fucking cloak and mirror. So my interface needed a reset because I was running it all fucking day. However. <laughs> These fucks don't help me out. Whenever I reset my interface, everything goes, <laughs> including your voice. So yep, everything. So if you uh, guys are just dies. if you guys are mid laugh <laughs> and I reset, it's all good. If you guys are talking and I reset, it's not. So when I say, "Hey uh, Tom, transition to a joke," Josh, you better fucking <laughs> laugh. It means let's make this a nice, smooth transition to Irk fixing his goddamn no, interface. No. Why? Why? This why is going really well. That? You're ruining why the mirror. You're, you're ruining the illusion, Eric. Fuck yeah, like I might have, I might have smudged the mirror so people could tell it's there, but you like fucking shattered it. Yeah, you just like kick that mirror open with your foot. You're just like, <laughs> you're like what? Yeah, you know, this mirror needs to go. <laughs> but anyway, anyway, high school teachers are like complaining at alarming rates about Fortnite Battle Royale just invading schools. Um, some some students who actually, you know, want to go to school to learn um, are complaining that nothing happens anymore. Like there, there's no learning. There's no class. People are just sitting on their phones and playing Fortnite. And yes, there's tons of blame to go around and none of it really belongs in Epic Slap. But I, I think that Fortnite Mobile is going to be fucking huge. Epic knows it, and I don't think any of us are adequately prepared for it. I don't think the gaming press has, has adequately talked about it. I really think this is going to be the next hot thing for the next two months or so. See, I think it may be a, it's a flash in the pan. Um, people who don't play on a computer or play on a console, okay, they'll be there. But if you have an Xbox, if you have a PlayStation, you have a PC, you're going home, you're not playing that on your damn phone. You're playing that where you actually want to play it. Get maybe ready. though, maybe like if I'm laying in bed, right? And, and Josh, it's like Fortnite. And I'm like, I don't know. I'm in bed. I don't want to put on pants and sit at my desk because I have to walk in front of a window. I might play it on, I might play it on the <laughs> no, phone. No, you like won't. That, that you might lying, be enough. son of a bitch. No one's doing I that. Might. Hey, no, I there might. actually was know. a guy. We were hanging out, uh, me and... Uh, and a few friends we were hanging out. We were about to. We were just playing Fortnite, and some random person just dropped in on their phone. They're just like, "Hey, what's up? Are we playing?" I'm like, you're on your phone. Like, wait, what? Like, you're just you opted for that? <laughs> they absolutely opted for that. So, do they have aim assist or something? They got it. I don't know. I've never played. They, it. they, there is a small amount of aim assist in both PUBG and Fortnite Battle Royale. Um, the thing that is really nice about these games, and Fortnite does it a little better than PUBG from the videos I've seen, is that. 
let's say you're on your phone, right? And I'm on my phone a lot where I don't have sound. I'm not actively wearing headphones and everything is muted because I'm not going to be that fucking guy. Um, but you will get um, visual aids for audio around you. Like uh, in PUBG, there will be, you know, like a, a red circle on your map um, and, you know, a piece of it will light up, letting you know that, hey, there is gunfire in roughly this direction. Um, Fortnite is the same thing. They show, you know, like little white splotches for footsteps. Uh, it's really, really well done. And it serves two purposes, right? It helps me if my phone is muted and I'm playing the game. But more than that, it makes the game accessible to people who are deaf. Um, which is that's, a really, that's actually really interesting. Well, well I was it's actually a fantastic about, feature, fantastic was, feature, and really easy to implement. I was actually about to ask you: Do you think they'll bring that to the PC? Because yes, I actually absolutely. I've heard this complaint actually about uh, Cuphead, uh, Cuphead's system yeah. of its ultimates, where the certain color is what you have to parry to get an ultimate build up, is actually very unfriendly to people who are colorblind because yes. you can't really tell what's going on. Where right now, Fortnite, if you can't hear, you can't win. Or not Fortnite, but Battle, or, uh, PUBG, really. I don't know about yeah. Fortnite as much. You can't hear if you can't win. So exactly. Having I, that I kind of indicator. Them, yeah, I can see them bringing this to, to everything that the system, or everything where the game is on. Um, it's It would be a dumb feature not to bring everywhere. I really like it. I mean, I'm... I'm not deaf, and I want this feature on the PC because it's really fucking helpful. Um, if anything, just to make sure that, you know, I'm paying attention in a red zone if I hear something else going on. Um, I, I think I really... It does give a little bit of a crutch. I, it does. I mean, it's one of those things where I want it there for people who are impaired, but at the same time, I don't want you to start kicking my ass because it's telling you where I am rather than you noticing where I am. That's true. That's true. But I mean, somebody could very well say, you know, um, if if they get the indicator, they can hear you anyway. So why don't they just fucking listen? And, and that's that's valid. I totally get where you're coming from, though. We'll, we'll have to see how how it ends up being implemented and, you know, possibly abused um, on the colorblind thing, though. And because we haven't mentioned it yet, and it's kind of a requirement for the 72 PZ drinking game. Big shout out to Rocket League uh, for the way that they handle their colorblind modes. Because you can go into mm -hmm. option and they've got a bunch of different options to tune it for specific types of colorblindness. The way icons show up, the way the cars are painted, the way the goals in the field is lit up. Really top-notch, absolutely accessible stuff. Psionics, good job. The thing that gets me, that's easy stuff to do. That really is. It is. It really is. I get yeah. it on maybe like a big AAA 2000 hour rpg it might be a little difficult but for a game like that dear god it's just reskinning a few things do it yeah yeah and, and they did a fantastic job i'm noticing it the, the more i look for it the more i notice it in more games the more i notice that there are now colorblind options which will you know reskin the game to be uh better suited for people with visual impairments with uh, auditory impairments. Um, I, I really like that games are becoming more accessible over time. Uh, and it's something that's been sorely missing from the industry for yeah, since I've been playing games. The industry is getting different. The industry is now more of a formalized people outside of the industry recognize the industry. Like, I mean, once Microsoft, I, to me, when Microsoft and Sony, Sony got in a little head, that was a big indication. Like, okay, these tech companies recognize that this is a sector of major importance. So now people are starting to realize, well, maybe we should give this the care that we do other ones. We should make it to where everyone can get here. Everyone can enjoy this, not just well, those who with good equipment or can actually see right. And it's a dollars conversation, right? So the game industry is fucking massive and it encompasses a giant amount of people. Psionics, I, you know, I, I'm sure they didn't do this, but someone like EA might say, hmm, we could get a couple thousand more people if we just had a programmer build in a reskin function. Uh, yeah, go ahead and do it. That's a couple thousand more sales for virtually no work, right? Okay, and I'm right. sure that I'm sure that there are times and and you know probably the majority of the time it's not no work, uh, but it is something that will sell more games, right? Somebody will look at this. Somebody will hear, um, you know, hey, this game is friendly to people who are blind. This game is friendly to people who are deaf. This game is friendly to people who are colorblind. 
Um, and there are communities and subreddits and, and Facebook groups around uh, accessible games. And those people do pay for games. They do res- uh, respect and reward the companies that cater to them. Also, I just, just to be fair, Psionics, it may not have been their number one thing, but I think people would, I mean, it's a little naive to think that it wasn't a factor. When it's like, should we do a colorblind accessible thing? To say that game sales wasn't a factor in the determining, I mean, it's it's definitely a factor. Like, will we do this? Yeah. Oh, it'll help us sell more. I'm not yeah. saying it's the main one, but it's definitely a factor for all companies. It's on the pros list. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, more money. Well, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean... Oh, I'll take more. But anyway. So uh, we've we've got a couple couple games coming to the Switch, one of which I'm actually really excited about because I keep trying to get into this on PC, but I want to play other things when I'm sitting down at my PC. Hyper Light Drifter. Um, <sighs> amazing art, amazing soundtrack, really fucking difficult game. I didn't think, the art didn't appeal to me. So I like okay. pixel art sometimes, but I'm not this junkie of it's pixel art, therefore I'm inclined to like it. To me, it's if it's pixel art, you better be doing something unique for me to really like it. Granted, they did. It's, they did, yeah, but the aesthetic did. did not hit for me. <clears throat> okay, that's fair. Uh, another game that I absolutely do not care about, but I know it's got a, a pretty fucking huge following, Ark Survival Evolved is coming to the Switch. And uh, I heard that they're also getting a mobile port, maybe? So... Hey, Switch is getting games. Mobile port makes sense. But to me, Ark, I want to play with people. And the Switch is not something I think (laughs) about when I want to play with people. Yeah, I never think about multiplayer when I think about the Switch. Until Super Smash Brothers. But we can keep waiting. Uh, But uh, maybe... maybe, ah, It didn't didn't resonate with me as well as it did for you. Yeah, true. It's a good game. it's, It's absolutely a good game. I just didn't get sucked in by it. Uh, we might not be waiting too terribly long, though, because mm-hmm. Nintendo has announced a Super Smash Brothers tournament for the new game in June. Uh, so, oh, crazy! So they like get your fucking hype on. Now, let's be fair. Tekken Seven did a tournament with Tekken Seven before Tekken Seven ever released. So oh, it's I'm not, not saying it will come of. out in June. Yeah, I, I, I think it'll come out maybe in August. I have no way of knowing anything, but I'm hoping it comes out in August. Uh, but tournament in June means the game is playable enough that they want to gauge community reaction. Uh, and that's awesome. And okay, um, we get to, yeah. here's a big thing. At that point, unless, unless they tell us before, we will know, is this a port of the Wii U? Is this a new game? Because as of right now, we don't know, though. Yeah, everything I've heard says new game, uh, but... You know, nothing's really been confirmed. With the really quick timeline, though, uh, I mean, then again, we don't know when development on this started, right? It could have started towards the end, or at the end of uh, the uh, Smash Brothers Wii U, you know, game finished. Yes, but at the rate uh, of which they've been porting games, like the new, um, the Captain Toad, that's a port of Wii U. They've been doing a Mario lot of Kart. ports. Mario Kart. Mario Kart was, support? Yes. So Zelda, I mean, Zelda, it wasn't a port, but it was kind of a dual release thing like they did it with Twilight Princess. It wasn't a port, but it took so fucking long and went to a new life cycle of a new <laughs> console. <laughs> Good old Nintendo. That always <laughs> fucking happens to them. That said, I will um, give them credit. They don't give you a release date until they know they hit it. Yeah. Yeah. Recent, and, and even when they give you a release date, it, they have no problem with saying, we're going to push it back a year. It's just not ready. And I am totally fine with this. I wish more people were totally fine with this. If the game isn't ready, don't release it. You're going to hurt me if you release a shitty game. Um, Miyamoto loves to say, you know, a delayed game is eventually good. A bad game is bad forever. It's true. Uh, well, it, it used to be. True, it's true most not of in- the time because Duke Nukem Forever was delayed, you know, for 15 some years. It was still bad. And bad games now, I mean, fuck, even good games now are launched. And by the time you actually play it for the first time, it's not the same. Even if you buy buy it day one. Day one's never the same as launch, which is a fucked up thing to say. Yeah, it's true. It's the world we live in. (laughs) It's the world we live in. It is. Speaking of the Um, world we live in is uh, the world of let's reminisce on some of the few last good Call of Duty games. 
The wasn't, last wasn't the recent Call one Duty really game. good. The, last, the, the recent one got really good reviews, but it still didn't sell as well. It still sell good. I mean, it's COD. They could say Call of Duty shit in toilet, and people are gonna buy the fucker. <laughs> oh shit! Was that not actually a thing? I just spent sixty bucks on it when you said those words. <laughs> Damn it! Okay, let I me cancel ask. my credit card. Oh, were, you a, were you a Call of Duty guy, Josh? Uh, I was at one point. About when did you fall off? Modern Warfare 2. Well, hey. There's a little bit of a uh, thing you might be interested in. Uh, uh, maybe. Well, I... <laughs> did you Tell actually me. play through the campaign of Modern Warfare 2? I have. All right. Because, so I guess um, maybe not. <laughs> well, because Modern Warfare 2 Remaster, um, they may be going a little against what they did before. It may only be the campaign. Or a single player, however you want to word it. Right, that's that what I heard. That so would be weird. a shame. That would be a that shame. That would be so weird to me. If if you want to guarantee that Call of Duty sales numbers are going to fucking tank for whatever you release, say, oh yeah, we're not going to include multiplayer because the vast for the vast majority of Call of Duty players, that's the only reason they buy the game. Um, the studio Activision has even said as much. They said, hey, look. We could release a game without a single player. The only reason we do is for people who have never played a shooter, they need a tutorial mode. So That's exactly, uh, yeah. yeah. I've never played through a campaign of a single Call of Duty. Really? Oh, you're missing out. You're missing out. Like They're actually the, quite good. I've played yeah, the original some parts, but... So the, the original Call of Duty, like the old-ass Call of Duty that was competing with Medal of Honor back when that was a thing, um, really fucking excellent. Call of Duty 2 on, I think it released with the 360. Fantastic game. You could probably get it for like two bucks on a Steam sale. Really fucking good. Um, Call of Duty 3, absolutely forgettable. Modern Warfare, that campaign was fucking outstanding. One of the best campaigns in any shooter I have ever played. Really great. Call of Duty 2, up the ante just a little bit. Wasn't quite as dialed in as Modern Warfare 1, but Modern Warfare 2 hit a bunch of high points, and it's still one of the best Call of Duty games I've ever played. It really is. It's that good. It, it's it's just a good ride. It there it was just really complete. It, and it just I don't know. It felt it felt like something. That's a weird. Point. That's a weird. That's a weird up. thing. That's a weird thing to say. But it just felt like something. It felt like you were doing something. See, I'm the weird guy that typically when I come to a game, I don't do it for the story. If it has a good narrative, fine. But when I come to a shooter, there is honestly only one shooter I play the campaign through every time. And that's Halo. Halo. Other than yeah. that, I don't. In Halo, it's story I like four went way off the fucking deep end. Five put it somewhere interesting. But it's just like I'm so vested. I want to know what the fuck's happening at this point. <laughs> i'll admit it like four's campaign four story four was garbage i mean if you could forget four ever happened good because fuck four man absolutely fuck yeah, that's four. that's that's some passion I, against four <laughs> i feel the same way about halo 2 i i stopped after after three but halo 2 broke my fucking heart because i was a halo one on pc player and it blew me away. It was so great. It had an interesting story, interesting world, well-developed characters. I, like, all of this in a shooter that redefined how we played shooters, right? Halo was the game that said, hey, offhand grenade deployment is cool now. Everyone should copy me. And everyone fucking did. Um, every game, every big shooter that came out after that was labeled as a Halo killer. And uh, spoiler alert, none of them did. Um, fucking uh, kill, <laughs> kill zone. Oh, Killzone is so goddamn trash. It is honestly one of the what, most what, overhyped. What about Bulletstorm? <laughs> oh, Jesus. Does anybody, re does anybody remember just, Bulletstorm? No, no, no. My, my day just got worse because you reminded me that Bulletstorm still exists. Actually, you reminded me there was Although, actually... Although, okay. the, the trailer for Bulletstorm was probably the best part about Bulletstorm. Yeah, that was the because, only good part. It was so good. I love that. There was oh, one other right. shooter Hold I enjoyed on. the story to, though. I have to say that. Resistant, Fall of Man, PS3. Oh, that, that was actually, that had a huge following. That, that game was awesome. Did. I heard was, two shit the bed, but one was awesome. Well, the, I, I had a okay. friend that was a part of a, a pro team on that one. And it was, and they, they were like, what, like top 10 in America. And it, it got really, real competitive. It's actually a, kind of a shame that it didn't like go much further than it did. 
I'm going to call out in chat. Uh, cool Bivens said, what about Rage? And I, I haven't ranted on this uh, probably since the last iteration of 72 Pin Connector. So we're bringing this one back. Thanks. Um, <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Uh, I, I pre-ordered Rage. I paid $60 at launch because it was from id Software. And I fucking love everything by id Software. Uh, they said, yeah, it's going to be like the next coming of Doom. It's going to be fucking amazing. And what I got was an absolutely broken shooter built in a broken engine with textures that were, you know, muddier than... I don't even fucking know what. Uh, it just... Everything was broken. The guns were uninteresting. The story was incomprehensible. The enemies were dumb as shit and impossible to kill, which was just fucking fantastic. And on top of all of this, they decide, let's throw in some Unreal Tournament 2004-style vehicle physics and make you do that for 80% of the game. Rage is honestly one of the biggest regrets I have as a gamer because it was so fucking broken and so fucking hyped and I will never pre-order anything by id Software ever again. You wonder why I waited you know, until six months after Doom 2016 came out to buy it? Rage is the, in is the only reason. <laughs> their their uh, Did you guys early demo, di their demo didn't software. help. Did you guys ever play um, Black? Yes, I love Black. Dude, Black like cool. when when Black came out, I was like, this is amazing. Like this is the craziest thing I've ever seen in my entire life. This is the first time I ever saw a bullet like like in destructible environments. Like I'm sure it's happened before, but like it was the first time I've seen it. It was the it was like it was so novel and so amazing. I was just like, what's next? This is the future. Well, the fucking and, you know, awesome I actually about, never bought that game. Awesome thing <laughs> the about black. Design. The, yes, the sound design where all the different bullets when they would run would be a different musical pitch. Well, I shouldn't say musical, but a different pitch to where it would actually make, I don't want to say chords, but like full sounds of wall that would come at you because the different oh, guns really? would have I didn't realize that they went yeah. that deep into it. Um, deep. When, I, when I was... It's uh, amazing. I only, like, because I, I mean, I was just, I was just super... Not, I, I didn't have a lot of money at the time. So I was just like, I, I got it on a demo disc. And I played the shit out of that demo disc. That's it was a, so good. That's the game me and my old roommate bonded over. Was he had a modded Xbox in the middle of our community room at college, and him and I played through the entire campaign of Black. Wow, love that's that pretty game. cool. You know, um, there was a couple games that there's a lot of games out there that I I really wanted to get my hands on, and I never actually played. And then like I forget about them, forget about them. Then I come back and I as like an adult, I'm like, oh my god, I need to play through this, but I still don't because I'm super lazy and terrible at playing games. Um, one is Fear. I've oh my god, always Holy wanted shit. to play through Fear. Like always wanted to play through Fear, and I know it's good how, and it looks how amazing. Do you not Oh my god. Okay, Fear is honestly one of my favorite shooters of that generation. I've never played it, it. Okay, Fear Fear does the perfect horror movie thing where but in in a video gamey way, the the enemy AI was intelligent enough that it won a shit ton of awards, it got a shit ton of patents. It was the only and it still is the only single player shooter that I have played where it felt like I was actually in a multiplayer match because the enemies were so intelligent. Really, yeah, it, really well tuned. And it was scary. It was terrifying. And it was terrifying for the right reasons because you, it put you against a wave of these super tough, like super smart enemies. And you'd like fucking murder all of them. And you're, you're riding high and you're just like pinning people to wall with like this steak gun. And it's just fucking epic and you're tearing shit up and you've got slow-mo and you're flying through the levels like Neo and <laughs> you climb a ladder and you're ready to like tear some dude's head off and a creepy little girl looks at you, laughs, and then disintegrates into ash and you are just crashed right off your fucking high. It just yeah. brings you <laughs> down. It's just like, yeah, you might be a badass, but you're terrified of a little girl. <laughs> yeah, no, when I saw the, uh, when I started, I played it I played um, a piece of it, and its its pacing was exactly that. Like you're just it, it's it handles the um, the balance of fear and excitement really well. Like like I feel like the scariest movies I've ever seen have a very really good comedic bits. Like 
it's all about balancing that high and low as it comes back and forth and swings you. It swings your emotion because, like, again, if you have those really high highs, those really low lows hit really hard. So, like, yes. if you're if you've just gone through and you're just like murdering everyone and and you just and you're just like laughing and like having a great time. Like, there was one I forgot what which one it was, but you got to get in like a mech suit. I think it must have been like one of the later ones. So, like, you're oh, doing crazy God. shit. Yeah. And uh, it, it didn't and- it didn't work. Fear two. Everything after the original fear was broken. Like one of the expansions was decent, but if you're gonna play fear, only buy fear one. You can probably get it for like two bucks on a Steam sale, or maybe a couple bucks on GOG. Uh, absolutely worth playing through. But forget anything else after that existed. It's it it was a good ride. I was having a great time. Um, so far, so far, it's it's really really good. I. <laughs> I don't play a lot of horror games. I don't play a lot of hor- games that have horror even in the hook of them. Like I've done horror Resident Evil, or I've done the Resident Evils because I always saw them as a little more actiony. But yeah, in general, I stay away from the horror type games. You stay away from the horror. I understand. Yeah, that's a good I, call. I got to stay clean. It, it's what I do. Yeah, dude, I get it. <laughs> um, so, Tom, how do you feel? Yes. that there's a new Vive coming out at the price of what we paid for ours, and ours is now five hundred. Um, I, I don't feel bad at all. Uh, I don't feel ripped off. I don't feel cheated. Um, I mean, let's, let's be real. We bought our vibes, what, like a year ago, two years ago, something like that. Year and a half, maybe. You're borderline um, three. I think I was just about, I'm two years right now. I, I mean, this is, this is the March of technology. Like I, I bought it and it's years later and the price is lower. Like, cool. That's that's great, actually. That's better news for me because I know that there are more people buying Vive headsets right now and more people I can play online with. Um, it's that's the, great. Yeah, that's yeah, act- that's the big deal. Like, that's that's what makes it good news. <laughs> you know what? You know what could <laughs> yeah. be awesome? Hover Junkers might come back to life. Hover oh Junkers God, might so be good. back. It's so good. Um, okay, so the new Vive Pro. Increased resolution, increased frame rate, like a bunch of really cool shit. Uh, it's 800 bucks for the headset alone. You're going to have to pay, you know, about 1200 to get everything you need to have a complete Vive setup without the computer. And thanks to all the cryptocurrency miners buying every graphics card they can get their hands on, you can probably expect to pay about 2500 if you're buying it retail, if you want to build a new VR-ready PC. So... Yeah. This is Ouch. the this is the gen right now where I know you guys are PC guys. If you don't have a PC, get you a PS4 and get you a Switch and it's going to be cheaper than trying to get a new PC. Yeah, like I if, if you can if you can spend the money, I do think a PC would be a better experience. Uh, I mean it is a better gaming experience, but you are absolutely going to pay the price. Uh, and it's it's only because cryptocurrency miners are buying every single hard drive they can get their hands on. Uh, NVIDIA has even got, uh, or yeah, graphics card. Um, NVIDIA has actually got a wait list and they make you sign a little thing that's not you know actually binding, but it, they basically make you say, hey, uh, I promise I'm not going to mine cryptocurrency with this. I'm only going to play video games and they can sell you a card direct, but it's really fucking hard to get that. And they sell out almost instantaneously. Um, yeah, yeah that, it's it's painful. This is the one time I will absolutely tell people if you're getting in, honestly, get a PS4 instead of a computer. And then if you want to try VR, it's like three hundred dollars for a PSVR. It's not the greatest, but it's not bad. I put it at the very. It's not en- bad. It's the entry level of real VR. Yeah, I would agree with that. You don't get your room scale, but it's real VR. Now that said, if you can find online, like. I used 970, I used 980 Ti, you know, and spend, you know, 500 bucks on a graphics card, that will still get you into OG Vive territory. So you can still get a $500 Vive headset, you can get the other stuff, you can get in on the entry level of VR, uh, or not entry level, but you can get on on a better level of VR than you would with the, the PlayStation. But again, it's going to cost you. If you're only getting a 970, don't do it. I don't think your gaming experience on a Vive would be good enough on a 970. I don't think it's worth the price there. I think the 980 Ti is where it really gets, okay, this is smooth. You can really enjoy the VR. 
because I think That's the fair. 970, like I had a um, a 380 AMD or a 390 AMD, and yeah, I could run it, I could play it, but it was still choppy from time to time. And with VR, if you get chop, it sucks. It really. Yeah, I can sucks. see that. Well, I mean, it's it, more it's, it. it's more a part of your body, if it makes any sense to say that. Like, like I played, I, I played on the on the PlayStation. PlayStation VR was fun. Um, there was a weird disconnect with my hands. I noticed. Like I, I felt like yes. my hands were a little bit further away than they actually were. <laughs> so when I actually, when I actually got out of the VR experience, I felt like everything was like a little bit closer in real life. <laughs> so, that happens in it's, all VR. My first time playing it. Yeah, does it does. Really? Okay, it does. I, I'm the driving. VR disassociation is a real thing. So. I, I was so impressed by my hands after taking off the Vive after playing for a couple hours at first. It was like, oh my God, it's so lifelike. And I, the controls are so in tune. <laughs> Wait a minute, these are just my fucking hands. Like, what the hell? Uh, yeah, I was, yeah, I was. That uh, happens to everyone. Uh, it was really surprising. I'm like, like, I'm like, every, like, it, like, everything's so much closer and so immediate. Like, I was like, oh. <gasps> Yeah, so. I, my first time driving home after playing, I'm my hands are on the wheel and I'm like, hold on, is that me? Literally had that kind of moment where it's like, this is, I almost, it's not my, might not be safe. What the fuck am I doing? It was really weird feeling. Um, yeah, VR disassociation is weird and real and kind of creepy, but you do get used to it. I no longer have VR disassociation. It took about five to 10 hours of playing to get over those feelings. Uh, mm. But you you do get over them. I no longer think my hands are Vive controllers. <laughs> but they're not. Bi- uh, I won't get there. Um, so, okay, you guys used to be consoles. Do you guys used to have a PS2? Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, do you guys ever play uh, Zone of the Enders? No. Yeah. Okay, so uh, Zone of the Enders 2 is getting a remaster again. Um, why 4K not? 4K ready. Ooh. Hey, let's just uh, reach in the grab bag of of games that were. Hold on, hold on. Wait, we're gonna. Let me. Let me. Uh, let me get my chart here. I'm looking it up. Oh, that's right. It's made by Konami. No, I don't care. Um, I will say, Zone of the Enders is probably the second best mech game I've ever played. The only one better is Armored Core Four Answer. Armored Core is so Armored, good. Yeah, the it is. Four Answer is great. Five went to shit. But four answer was awesome. And um, did you guys ever play? Um, there was one that was really good. What was it called? Um, there was one in particular where you had like it was like a tournament mode, and you oh. had to like fight your way. It was really, really. You really had to fun. go up the ranks. Yeah, like you had the campaign going, but at the same time, every while you'd be able to get to a tournament match against yeah, someone. Yeah, so fun. Yeah, oh that was gosh. four. That was four answer. That one was amazing so fun i bought mm-hmm. five when it came out and then i'm just like oh my god what the fuck did they do i would love a really good mech vr game but i haven't found one yet yeah good luck dude oh dude mech yeah. vr oh dude okay dude you know what i want i want them to say okay here's your vibe but we are going to set this game in a sitting position and you've got your vive controllers you have to sit them like vertically and act like they're mech yes. joysticks that's what I fucking want. I want to sit in my well, you know, chair. You, what was that I want to game? spin around with a headset on. That's what I need. What was that game that came out? It was um, ah, fuck. It was a mech game. Steel it was, Battalion. Thank you. Steel and it had like Battalion. it had like the one hundred and eighty, two hundred thousand yes. dollar freaking ship. Oh my god! It had like all these buttons and switches and knobs. Yeah. All right. All right. <laughs> For those who who don't know, okay. First off, go Google Steel Battalion controller right now. It's got three separate like half keyboard sized uh controllers with a bunch of dials and knobs and buttons all over the fucking place that you would lay out in front of you in a semicircle and then it had a three pedal system that you put at your feet on on the control panel in front of you there's actually an eject button with a pop-up red window that you have to eject if your mech is blowing up if you die inside of your mech, the game erases your save file. You have to eject to keep. Oh, your does data. it really? I didn't yes. know that. I didn't know the details about it. I just knew that that it existed and it was ridiculous. Steel Battalion is one of the coolest fucking things to ever come out on any gaming console ever. 
um <laughs> og xbox and oh my god i want one so bad seven hundred dollars right now on amazon jesus fucking christ oh my god it's 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 honestly gonna be like a collector's item at some point like absolutely like absolutely. somebody's gonna be like oh check it out so like here's my nintendo glove and then there's my steel battalion setup I'm like you have a steel battalion setup holy shit let's get on that right now <laughs> that is so fucking cool awesome oh i've never seen that before that is fucking rad dude it, it is so so good and i wish that it was used for more than one game well i mean it, it's just like it's kind of the guitar hero situation but like to the nth degree right like <laughs> yeah. yeah like you're like you're like hey everybody i have to buy all my peripherals not only that but i also have to store them and not only that they're like a thousand dollars you know they okay could've, guys they could've made, i've got, they I've got made it. money by doing like hey armor core go ahead use this in your games and just give us two dollars per they game you sold they should so, have they should have made more deals but they didn't i i think i've got the answer here okay so our uh -huh. next game jam we're going to make a vr mech game okay or our next game jam we're going to make a mech uh vr labo game for the switch <laughs> yeah oh, wow. there okay. we go because <laughs> you know i've got enough money to afford a bunch of cardboard honestly i'm waiting for labo vr they're gonna do it they're gonna it'll do happen it. guaranteed i'll have it but they're gonna do it yeah oh i'll buy it <sighs> speaking damn of, right i'll buy it speaking of do it uh do you see epic games uh released all the assets of paragon the game they're not doing it yeah, that was really fucking cool. So yeah, that's a, Epic, that's a that's a cool move by them. Yeah, they they shut. I mean, that said, it's it's kind of you know they're pimping their engine a little bit, the, the free Unreal Engine, but it is only licensed to be used in the Unreal Engine. You can't just take all that stuff and use it in Unity. Uh, which I get it. And hey, they released twelve million dollars worth of assets, saying ah. Make your games a little shinier. So we can be guaranteed we're going to see all of these assets in every little Unreal Engine demo for the rest of all time. Because Unreal is a very popular engine. Fuck yes, yeah. it is. It's like, it's the engine. Did, does any, have any of you guys actually looked up um, like what you have to do if you make your game in Unity? Or, uh, yes. Unity, I'm a fucking retard. <laughs> Unreal, thank you. Yeah, in, in both. <laughs> uh do you want to break it down? Because I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head about like yeah, how much you um, have to talk talk a little bit while I mute and well, type because people don't so want to hear while, that. While he's doing that, the one big thing I do remember is uh, Unreal is a upfront cost for the engine and stuff. Where Unity, no, not no, anymore. it's not, not anymore. anymore. They change that. Yeah. Yes, so just so people know that if you want to make a game in an engine, you have to pay money. Woo, crazy, right? That's a totally brand new concept, right? You have to pay money to the people that made the engine. And that usually isn't free. It's usually quite a bit. And it, not only that, but a lot of times you actually have to pay royalties on top of that. So like, let's say you choose Unreal and you go with that. If that game makes money, there's a certain amount of money or a certain, certain percentage that those people make back. Now you can work like, like crazy deals and partnerships and weird shit like that, but it's kind of insane. <laughs> so, un fair. so Unreal no longer charges on publish? Unreal does not? No, they do not. Okay, because it oh, used to it's until good. Unity With came the in, and I know Unity, I think, forced them to change the hand then. Yes, they did. Yes, they did. Unity is responsible for making all of these big, fancy, professional-level game engines available to everyone. So Unity came in, and they said, hey... You can just download this shit for free. You don't have to sign up for anything. You don't have to give us a credit card. Just you know, There's no trial version. Just fucking download it. If you want a pro version with a black theme, you gotta pay for that one, but you don't have to. But Here's the catch. Yeah. If you make X amount of dollars, you owe us X that, percent. Yeah. That's it. That's, that's yeah. the most... Like, it's, it, it's seems, it seems great. bad in a way. Like, it, it kind of does. But it's kind of amazing it's because if you're if you're just like a like a like a on your own developer kind of guy you can just go make a game it's not a big deal what's impressive is that's dangerous for an up-and-coming engine to do because you don't have the 
you don't have the market share to be able to risk that. Where an engine like Unreal, they have the market share where they know that they're getting big games. So they say, oh, yeah. you make more than 50000 you pay us. They know that they're getting the games to do that. Something like Unity, they may only ever get indie devs that were never going to make anything big. Granted, we know different now. I'm just saying when this first started. They could right. have it was it. kind of a, it, it was definitely like not a, it was like, okay, Unity, you sure about this, dude? And he's yeah, no. like, yeah, we got this. We, we know. Like, okay, so here's, here's the details. Um, royalty payment and tracking for the Unreal Engine. Uh, once you've begun collecting money for your product, you'll need to track gross revenue and pay 5% royalty on that amount after the first $3,000 per game per calendar quarter. Um, so yeah, you make over $3,000, you gotta pay Epic 5% for their engine. But only um, if you made more than 3,000 that quarter, it sounds like. Only if you made, uh, more than 3,000 per game, or I'm sorry, uh, after the first 3,000 per game per quarter. So it does sound like you will need to continue paying 5% of gross afterwards. That said, if you make zero, 5% of zero is zero, so it doesn't cost you anything. Right, um, and it's really nice to like take risks and stuff like that. That yeah. that enables developers to take risks on on various like really interesting and, things. And let's let's say that you've got you know guys like us who are making a game and a game jam. We're not going to see a goddamn dime from this. We're just wasting all of our time. Um, <laughs> and uh, right. we're we we release a game, right? We're not going to make any money, so we don't have to pay Epic well, anything because it's not for sale. It's for free. And it's really good because it's probably the second best engine out there. The only the only engine better, I don't know if any indies using that's Cryptic Engine or System. Uh, oh, yeah. uh, you mean Crytek? Crytek, there so, we go. Crytek, I think, God, I think they, that became they, Lumberyard. I think uh, I think Amazon bought Crytek or bought the their engine. Did they really? Pretty sure. sure. I think it's lump. I think it's lumberyard. Is now. Amazon getting in the game development? Oh yes, yeah. We uh, actually. Um, yes, earlier... we have talked about this before. Okay, disclaimer. Yeah. Disclaimer time. Uh, Amazon pays Irk and I's paychecks. We work for Amazon. We do not speak <laughs> on behalf of Amazon, and we are not sharing anything that's not public because we don't know anything that's not public in the game design thing. We don't work for the game studios. Amazon Game Studios is a thing. They are making games. They do own Twitch. They sell the games to the Twitch app. That's. Yeah, they are in the game business. Cool. Yeah, uh, they also have um, AWS. Again, disclaimer, that's who I work for, but not the game part of it. Does do a lot of stuff for game developers like servers and matchmaking capabilities and Lumberyard, which is a game engine. They, they have a lot of products like that. Um, I haven't used the engine, so I can't speak to it. On Unity, though, um, here's the pricing details. If your company currently makes more than 100K in annual gross revenue or has raised funds in excess of 100K, you are not permitted to use Unity Personal, which is free, for prototyping or otherwise. Um, you may use Unity Plus. So we, we'll look at, yeah, we'll look at Unity Plus um, and estimated uh, prepaid for one year is about 400 bucks per seat. Oof. Yeah, 400 bucks per person using it. But that said, that's only when you hit $100,000 in revenue or $100,000 in funding. So if you're making less than that, Unity's free. Yeah, and that's really, when it comes to big, big budget stuff, that's dropping the hat for indie stuff. Yeah. That's really still not that bad. Here's, here's the thing. With Unity, um, you don't pay royalties. No royalties, none. That's quite good. Yeah. That, that's, that is awesome. Also, I do and, want... Go ahead. Um, Unity and Unreal give asset creators, like artists, digital models, people that make, make textures, music, code, all that stuff. You don't have to build a game to make money with these engines. You can instead build a model or build some music and put it in one of these uh, you know, engine marketplaces. And when people buy it, you get some money, which is great. It's kind of like... Uh, kind of like you know, building something and putting it on an app store, or like Works being the same an way. artist. Just yeah. you get a lot of print presses. Yeah, but yeah, <laughs> print presses. Don't laugh. But I was yes. distracted. Yes. Print presses. <laughs> um, the engine I was thinking was CryEngine, and you were sort of right, Tom. 
Amazon is licensed to build Lumberyard on top of CryEngine, but CryEngine is still okay. their own. Okay. I don't so, know anything big still using uh, the CryEngine. Far Cry? I mean, other, other than Far Cry. But the, the, because the, they, en- the engine just looks phenomenal, though. That's the thing that gets me. It's like, best it's, it's looking beautiful. engine out there. Okay, so I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tone that back a little bit. Uh, the CryEngine is the best looking engine out there if you are making a lush, densely populated forest area. If you are making anything other than a lush, densely populated forest or a wilderness of some kind, it is the wrong engine 100% of the time. It's beautiful. Mm. Beautiful. It is for, for one use case. It's beautiful in like one specific use case. If you are making just cause, yes, it would be great. If you're making Far Cry, yes, it would be great. If you're making Half Life 3, no. Half-Life 3 doesn't take place in a jungle. It takes place inside of the minds of gamers. More so if you're making Half-Life. Because <laughs> it doesn't exist? Wait, exactly. are you trying to tell me that... that <laughs> you just said Half, that the real Half-Life, Half-Life 3, 3 is clever. a text that was document. <laughs> so Half-Life the 3 engine is... for Half-Life 3 is, is what, like Word? Is that how we're going to go with? <laughs> Half-Life... Half-Life. What nope. we didn't realize is that Half-Life 3 is really the friends we made along the way. <laughs> that All sounds right, I'm terrible. A fan. I'm a fan of that. <laughs> that sounds terrible. In other news, uh, Vivendi has stopped their, uh, their big... Um, I just lost the word. Hostile Take- acquisition. Yes, hostile takeover of Ubisoft. Um, they sold all of their shares, and Tencent snapped them right up. So, uh, yeah. Well, it's, that's cool. Tencent didn't really snap it up. Tencent's only hit sitting at five percent. Yeah. So, in other words, it comes down to it got divvied up enough. Ubisoft's not worried now. So I'm I'm happy because yeah. I Ubisoft. I was actually talking about this earlier today. I think Ubisoft is actually probably the best of the big name developer or big name publishers right now. They've been doing stuff the way you want a big publisher to do it. I don't know. I still don't like them. If they would, if they would come out like and publicly assassinate a mascot wearing a Uplay costume, I might start to like him again. You see, that's you not liking them, them for no reason. There needs to be blood. There needs to be blood. That's all I'm saying. Because the, be blood. the way they support their games is fantastic. It's like, oh, let shit, me, let me you have, didn't like this let when me have it started. My two minutes of hate. No, no, because yeah, you're just yes. hating because it's not Steam. Fight the power. No, you, you're I, fighting I, I, for you're I, I, fighting you for the power. Wrong. What are you talking I, about? I, there is the power. <laughs> fight against the not power. Except if you're Gog or Humble, because I like those guys and they're nice to me. Humble is the power, man. What the fuck are you talking about? IGN's <laughs> behind them. Nintendo's oh, also shit. the power, man. <laughs> oh shit, they are the power. Nintendo has no power. Power of what? Nintendo <laughs> will after this gen, man. This gen it's is the power their- of love. It's the power got. of goofy ass shit. So speaking uh, of game engines, yeah, uh, I, I didn't want to get into this because yeah, this is nerdy. <laughs> Let's do it. Okay. Uh, Epic has shown a cool demo of a new Unreal Engine feature and a $60,000 graphics card, uh, a nine, uh, NVIDIA 970 um, a, at current market rates. Um, that's a Bitcoin mining joke. Um, hey. Uh, showing active uh, real time <laughs> ray tracing. Yeah. So uh, for those active real time, yeah. <laughs> Go it's, ahead. It's doing real time ray tracing. In other words, what this means is you draw one line from the perspective. Let's say in real life, your eye. You shoot one line out of your eye. You only see what's in that line. Super detailed, but only what's in that line. They are shooting a line from the camera through the entire scene. So they're shooting millions of lines out. Traditionally, this is this how is, your Pixar movies are rendered, is through yeah. ray casting. You have, so hey, go ahead, Tom. Pixar has literally a giant, massive fleet of ultra-powerful computers that crunch and crunch and crunch for you know months to make a movie, to render a movie in the highest quality. If you've ever seen a Pixar animator work on something, you usually see their animation. It's like, holy shit, you're viewing this at like 
two frames without textures like what the fuck is wrong with you oh that's, that's not well they, they they view the full frame they that's they they live and and breathe the frames so <laughs> but they, they have to right they can't view the scene at rendered movie quality right. yeah they're not viewing that impossible <laughs> um yeah with unreal and apparently a sixty thousand dollar graphics card that's kind of possible now. Maybe not like Pixar levels of quality, but really fucking close. And this um, is it's super important. Check it out. Super important. Yeah. It sounds really this is nerdy next right gen now. Next-gen graphics technology. You, you know what I'd really like to see? And this is something like, this is crazy, right? Like th just them doing these rendering. What I'd love to see is Euclidean. And I'd really love to see Euclidean just nail it because it's so underground and there's not a lot of people that even know what's going on with them. I just love to see them just fucking nail it and then it become the main thing. What's Euclidean? Do you guys, so Euclidean, do you guys know anything about point clouds? No. Okay, so point clouds uh, are- Are you talking are, like a ply file kind of thing? Nope, uh, maybe, no. Uh, what, what it is is you take this laser scanner and you go out and you scan an environment. And, and what it is is, it's a little box that sits on top of like a, a surveying tripod, right? And the box rotates and a laser shoots straight up out from the center of the box. And then it hits a little mirror that spins like this. And what it effectively does is it hits, like it goes up and shoots out and hits a point. And then it registers that point and comes back to the, to the uh, scanner, lets it know that that's happening. And it'll just spin and, and paint, like literally paint the whole room with lasers, with, you know, with this laser. And it gets this cloud, right? It, uh, it has all of those points are being registered and it gets this cloud of an environment. And it's a really interesting technology. It's being used heavily in visual effects. It's being used heavily in um, a lot of the stuff that you guys are, uh, a lot of the games that we're playing now uh, you, you use point clouds. Um, a lot of and what's really a, good 3D models use that, yeah, because that's right. how you get really good lighting effects is through those. Uh, kind of, yes. Um, but the the biggest thing is you get a very, very accurate representation of what exists in real life. What Euclidean did is they took those point clouds and instead of turning... So the, the step is usually take those point clouds, turn them into the model, and go. Yes. What Euclidean did is they took the actual point cloud and they made a game engine around that point cloud. So you have collision on the point cloud and you can navigate the environment. So what they were saying is that um, using uh, another technology that they built on top of that, like essentially using like pop in graphics, right? The closer the camera gets to the ground, the more points render. So they were able to zoom into like the dirt, like the, like the little pebbles on the ground. They were able to zoom into those and the space hmm. that they contain around them. And so what that means is that there's no poly count limit. You have zero poly count limit. And that's, you know, the thing that shackled every industry for a long time. So I would absolutely love to see, like, you can Google it. Um, Google Euclidean. Uh, they have a whole bunch of stuff to, to, to look up and check out. Um, but it'd be so cool because, like, all of these different aspects of, you know, graphics would be... It would just be so interesting because that would be the big turning point. Like right now we're talking about polygons and lighting and rendering and how, you know, light interacts with all these things. Like if you were think about it as living in a world of cells instead of a world of shapes. Hmm. hmm. That's interesting. That would be. So, so it's pretty amazing. I really hope that they just fucking nail it because <laughs> if they did, it would be very cool. You know who didn't fucking nail it? Hmm. EA when they released Star Wars Battlefront 2 the, guess, the next generation and you know who <laughs> finally realized they didn't nail it when they released Star Wars Battlefront 2 EA yeah so if they would have done this yeah. like a month and a half ago I might have actually ended up gotten into the game because the game's good it is it's a good game um so uh I guess they have now in addition to the stuff we mentioned last week where they were actually fixing the progression system um, they have now unlocked every hero in Star Wars Battlefront 2. So, yeah. Uh, all heroes and hero ships for everyone. And now the way you actually progress through them is spending time on them, and then you get experience for them that you then redeem for star cards for them. So there's still some yeah. RNG to it, but there's no RNG that you sponsor by your wallet. It's, it's not pay to win. It's 
play to win, which I think is better, right? Call of Duty has followed that model through all of their multiplayer and people don't seem to hate it. So yeah, it's yeah. Um, yeah. too it's little okay. too late, but you know, I, I guess that's nice. Cheers. And I guarantee you the next Star Wars Battlefront game won't be called Battlefront. It'll happen, but it won't be called Battlefront. <laughs> I hope it gets made by someone else. I hope it gets made by, I don't even fucking know. The company that just got not fired. Yang, I mean, not, um, not DICE. <laughs> Disney? Well, I don't, I don't know. Disney's I don't own know. game developer studio that they'll come no, up with. No, bring, and... bring LucasArts back, damn it. Bring that's, LucasArts back. It's not happening. That would be great. I love the if, Lego if Star anything, Wars. If anything, Disney at some point, and I guarantee you this will happen, at some point, Disney will open a game studio. They have to. They, they're too big not to. It's just going to happen. And there's too much I, money in it. There's too much. In, and you know who loves money? Disney loves money. <laughs> so, but what's, like, what's weird so on, is they've, on backed, YouTube, they've backed away from it, though, is the thing. They had Xfinity. They had a really good platform, and they backed away. They closed it down. They did. They did. I, don't, I don't know why. Uh, apparently, I don't get they, it. I don't know. The, the game industry is is risky, though, for AAAs, right? You either knock it out of the park and make money hand over fist, or you lose millions of dollars. And there's that's it, right? As a AAA developer, there is no, yeah, it was kind of successful. It's either you made all of your money back and then some, or you lose millions and no middle ground. And when you lose, oh, fuck. I think millions is yeah. actually an understatement. Um, really, really yeah. cool story. A little segue. Um, it was uh, Kurt Schilling, former Hall of Fame pitcher for the Red Sox, World Series winner. When he got out of the big leagues, he founded 38 Studios. He was making his own game company. And being a millionaire, fuck, I don't need to fund it. I'm going to use all my money. Dude went bankrupt because his company just fucking folded. Yep. That's brutal. I can't imagine, like... I can't imagine like being so in, like investing super hard in something like that and then just fucking losing it all. It's, it's that's, not, that's a mean, blow. To well, have. and it's not just losing can, all what you were spending your time and your heart in. You lost all your financial earnings for your entire life. And then, then, so it's not only that. Like, if we want to take a look at the game industry, it's completely fucked for for large studios and basically anyone who's not an indie, and then most indies too. Um, right? You you have people working. 60 hour week minimums, usually 80 hour weeks, um, sleeping under their desks during crunch time, uh, if they're sleeping at all, um, and not just, you know, face planting into a keyboard and then hitting control Z when they wake up. Um, but you, you've got people who are underpaid for what they do compared to, you know, commercial industries, right? Any game developer who's a great programmer can go and make. 1.5 times the salary by going to any tech company or two times the salary going to any startup. Um, you've got people getting underpaid, overworked. Um, and then if their game fails, then they get fired. Um, or or let's say, let's say they don't get fired. Let's say the game is almost ready to ship. They get fired before the game comes out so they don't have to get a bonus when the game does well. Um, or they get hired during crunch time and then they know that, you know, at the end of crunch time, they're out of a job. Like, the whole game industry is completely fucked. <laughs> it's true. That sucks. To be fair, that can actually be extrapolated to the larger tech sector, but... Not, not really, though. I mean, I don't y know about you, but Y2K? I'm, I'm not working... Y2K was exactly that. Exactly that. People got hired okay. in on a storm of wave after wave of people. And once it passed, it all of them got laid off. What do you think someone coming in in crunch time for a game company is? It's a contractor. What I'm saying is that I don't think there's any comparison because that's, that's I mean, you're talking about an event that happened once. I'm talking about every fucking day. No, 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 no. In the I'm talking industry. anytime a company is moving from one tech to another, they bring in a lot of contractors to do it and then get rid of them when it's done. That is that's, the tech sector true. at large. No, that is that is like point events in company history, right? It's not every fucking day. There's no it's, comparison. Yeah, it's, I don't, it's, I don't it's work point eighty hours a week. Like, it's a point event, just like releasing a game is a point event. I, you don't release don't in work, a game every day. I, I am never going to claim I work as much as a game developer because I absolutely do not. I get to come home. I know game developers that come home. 
<laughs> I, I don't. I don't. The only ones I know are locked up in the cages in Blizzard's office. Well, that's good. But <laughs> they feed and, them occasionally. Last little bit of news. It's better than EA, man. It's better than EA. I don't know. The Madden developers got it pretty fucking easy. Rinse the library, uh, make lots they, of money. Yeah. All they have to do is update a CSV file and hit publish. New new <laughs> rosters and a new way to catch a ball. Yep, that's it. But um, <laughs> one little last thing in news that I actually am really excited about, even though I didn't play any this week. Uh, Monster Hunter World's new update has dropped. It's free. It is bringing back some old uh, missions that were missed by people because you were too low of hunter rank like I was or others. So you can go back and actually accomplish those now as well. New monster to hunt. Um, this is a throwback to Monster Hunter 3. Um, man, I butcher this fucker's name every time I try to say it. Devil Joe? Devil Joe? Devil Jew? Devil John. John? Devil John. It's just John. Just but, John. Um, it's, Devil it's, John. A, it's just John. It's a big ass dragon from <laughs> Try. So new new monster, new gear, uh, revisit on some old um, uh, time and place missions so you can get a hold of. I don't know if they brought back the Watcher mission for PS4 or not. Hopefully, because that's fucking awesome. But that said, um, I think that's just about all we really have. Um, so, saying that, you're watching us. You're probably on Twitch. You probably watch us every Are week. They? Because you're probably, Are they, though? Because you're probably pretty awesome. Um, so, I think it's a good time to remind everyone that starting April, we will be going to once a month rather than once a week. So the first Saturday of every month, you can come catch us live on Twitch at twitch.tv slash 72 pin connector at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific time every first Saturday of the month. But fear not. If you miss us, you can still come catch us at 72 pin connector podcast. Nope. 72 pin connector at YouTube. Oh, my God. I blended our Twitter. Um, so go there. <laughs> you can catch up on all the shit you missed, fellas. Just do it. Um, you tweet at us at 72 PC podcast. Let us know what we're talking about. If you like it, if you hate it, what you want us to talk about, especially in this new month format. Give us questions. Give us what you want us to talk about. It's going to be once a month. It's going to be longer. Get your voice heard a little more. Be in the chat. Tweet at us. Be interactive with us. We respond. We're fun. Also, speak for yourself. We well, love you. We do. Um, wow, that's really rapey, you guys. You can't do that. It's not okay. <laughs> it's how I like to talk, though. Um, you can always catch the actual <laughs> podcast as audio from all your favorite providers. YouTube, uh, not YouTube, holy shit. Google Play, iTunes, Stitcher, Pocket <laughs> Cast, say, all of them. Bring it in. Bring Fuck, it home. I got to <laughs> nail it home. If you want RSS feeds, go to 72 pinkinextra.com. Grab them like a goddamn that's barbarian. That's what we go with. This is us. Ah, okay. And with that's that, Eric on a plate, everybody. You can I, get all of my podcasts at 72pinconnector.com. And also, you can join the community. Come. We, we talk through the day, every day on our Discord. If you're at our Twitch, go down. You'll see a link to our Discord. Otherwise, go to 72pinconnector.com. You'll see the link. Jump in. Hang out with us. We play a fuck ton of different games. Just have a good time. And with that said, does anyone have anything else they'd like to say on the way out? Yes. The postcast game is actually a postcast game jam where we're going to be streaming some game jam stuff. And you're going to see us try to make a shitty little platformer and fail every step of the way. So tune in. It will be hilarious. Yeah, it'll be frustrating. Enjoy. Yeah. Or play <laughs> games. People will be on the server. Find some people. Oh, play we, some games. Oh, we do have a, a request from chat. Talk God damn it. Oh. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I think that's all we got for you this week. So, until next time, game on. See you guys. Okay.